it's now time. About time. Okay. Yeah. See you later. Bye. See you so, hi, another warm welcome from Midland Golden Retriever um, Club. We're really excited to have uh, Dr. Laura Owen with us this afternoon, who is going to talk to you about ectopic ureter, which has been a problem in the breed ever since I've been involved. And um, I know that Margaret Woods, the, um, the health rep for the Breed Council, has um, done an awful lot of work to try and... Um, develop an awareness of the problem and look at different ways of treating. And we're very, very privileged that Laura has been doing a lot of very interesting background work. And um, I'll pass you over to Laura. Thank you very much, Penny. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. And I hope that by the end, um, I will have managed to explain to you exactly what we're dealing with. And we'll probably have still more questions than answers. But uh, when we know what the questions are, we can start hopefully uh, working together to find the solutions. That's great. We'll open up the chat at the end of your talk so that um, people will be able to type in and ask questions. So during the during the actual talk, um, or everybody will be on silent, but we'll open the chat at the end. So that okay. would be great. Yeah, super. OK, so I'll just share my screen, I hope. Okay, can you see that okay? Yeah, that's great. Lovely. Let me just minimize everybody else. That's it, so I can see. Lovely. So, um, Penny has invited me this afternoon, very kindly, to discuss with you a little bit more about what you would term wet puppies, or otherwise we would term ectopic ureters as the medical sort of synonym. So the title of my talk is Fixing the Leaky Tap, Ex Ectopic Ureters Explained, and hopefully you'll feel that uh, you know a lot more about them when we get to the end. Oh, just forward. So uh, the plan of the talk is um, we're going to look at what are ectopic ureters, because many of you may not be familiar with this condition. We're going to look at how we might recognise or diagnose the condition what the treatment options are. And then importantly, at the end, we'll talk about the research that I've been doing and uh, what we might be able to do either now or in the future to see if we can reduce the incidence or, or prevent this condition. So to begin, uh, what are ectopic ureters? Why are these puppies wet? So here is a, a picture, it, it is drawn by my own hand and I'm no artist, so uh, it's not, not going to be perfect, but hopefully we can uh, look at this together. So this comprises the urinary tract in a dog. So what we would have is two kidneys. So this is one here sitting just under the rib cage and one the other side. And then the ureter is in green, this tube that connects the kidney to the bladder. So the kidneys will filter uh, any of the unwanted substances from the blood and any water that we don't need. That will make urine and then the urine will travel down the ureter into the bladder where it will initially be stored. And then when the bladder becomes full, it will um, cause the muscle of the bladder wall to stretch. That will trigger some receptors to say uh, we need to pee here and then this bladder muscle will contract and this tube the urethra will relax and that will allow the urine to exit the vulva. So it's unfortunate these two have very similar names but the ureters are what we're going to be predominantly talking about today and then we have the urethra which is the tube from the bladder to the outside. So if you can just remember those two things, that will help you to understand what's going on. And this system is uh, very complex. It's probably one of the most complex body systems. We have the anatomy, which needs to be right in order for this to work. We also need to have a fully functioning nervous system. And that involves both the involuntary nervous system, because most of this goes on <coughs> sorry 
without us knowing about it. We're not choosing to contract our bladder and urinate most of the time. That just, that just happens. And then we do also have some voluntary control. So if we're not in a place uh, or the dog isn't where they can urinate, they will be able to uh, hold that urethra nice and tight and wait until a more suitable moment. There's also hormones that influence this system, uh, such as estrogen. And then there are other substances and receptors that all come into play as well. So it really is a very complicated system. And that in part will explain why the outcomes are not as simple as we might expect uh, when we get further along. So what is an ectopic ureter? Well, if we look at this normal ureter on this side, it's coming down and it should enter roughly this triangular area of the neck of the bladder. So here is our normal opening. When we have an ectopic ureter, it means that the opening is instead further, further down in the urethra instead. There's two types. The most common, which is in about 95% of dogs, is the intramural type. So, sorry, I keep losing my cursor uh, here, so called in red. And with the intramural type, the ureter enters the bladder wall at roughly the same location as the, the normal side. But instead of having an opening that the urine can get out of into the bladder, this ureter instead travels through the wall and then it enters, opens, sorry, at any point along this urethra. The second type that we can have is an extramural ectopic ureter. And in this case, here's our extramural ectopic ureter. It's completely bypassing the bladder and it's just entering the side of the urethra. And this is quite rare in dogs. Uh, it's much more common in cats. So in dogs, it makes up less than 5% of any cases that we see. And so what we will normally see from this condition is urinary incontinence because the urine is not being stored properly in the bladder and it is instead leaking out through the vulva or the prepuce. We know that this is an inherited disease because it only affects some breeds. So we know that it affects the golden retrievers and that's why we are here today. Also affects the Labrador retriever, generally in smaller numbers. The poodle, um, usually the toy and the miniature are affected. Newfoundlands and then we have Siberian Huskies, French Bulldogs, uh, just to add to their list of problems. And, uh, and several more. And then we have other breeds, for example, Greyhounds, Hungarian Vizslers, Dobermans, Rottweilers, are breeds that this condition has never been reported in. So it's very, it is breed specific and therefore a, a heritable disease. As we'll see later, unfortunately, the heritability is not simple. How do they present clinically? Well, classically, we, uh, hence the term wet puppies, we would see this condition in young puppies, certainly less than six months of age, and very commonly at weeks of age. So an absolutely classical presentation would be um, a breeder who would notice that the puppy was wet, anything from a few days after birth to a few weeks, and then would present that puppy usually to the local vet, they would often give a course of antibiotics to check that it's not just a urinary tract infection and the incontinence would unfortunately persist. And then we would be, have a very strong suspicion in an affected breed that ectopic ureter was the problem. It's not always noticed that young. Sometimes if the puppies are with mum and she's very good at uh, cleaning them, sometimes, or they've got just very mild incontinence, then it might not be noticed until that puppy goes on to a new home. And then the new owners might notice some little wet spots on the floor or that the puppy is generally sort of damp around the perineal area. As well as the mum not being present to clean the puppies, the other thing that changes as they get older is they produce more urine because they're bigger dogs. And that might also be a reason why you might notice. 
and the urine becomes more concentrated as the puppy grows. So it, the smell of urine might become more apparent as the puppy is a little bit bigger. So we might see wet perineal area, we might see spots of urine on the floor, we might see actually urine just dripping from the vulva or prepuce, or we might see that either the puppy or the mum is excessively licking that area. And we may find just a urine smell, we may have a, a, a more um, nasty smell based on a subsequent infection of that urine. So that would be uh, absolutely classically what we would see. But we do see this condition in older dogs as well. And that's any age. Um, it's been reported to be diagnosed in dogs up to the age of 10 years old. And I suspect there are dogs that are even older that uh, just haven't been diagnosed. Can be males and females. But it's more likely in an older dog that it would be a male uh, that we would have missed when it was a puppy. And the reason I hope is explained in this diagram here. So in the bitch, we have the bladder and then a relatively short urethra. It has some smooth muscle all the way along, which is under involuntary control. And then just at the end here, it has what we call striated muscle which is under voluntary control. So this is the bit that the, the dog can squeeze itself. In the male, we've obviously got this much, much longer urethra. And again, all of that is lined with muscle, with the smooth muscle. And then two thirds of it is also lined with this muscle that's under voluntary control. So in a male dog, this urethra has much, much greater muscle tone than in the female. And that means that the males may not necessarily be incontinent until maybe they get much older. And then unfortunately, as with most things um, with age, they get weaker with time. And so when these dogs are older, this muscle potentially weakens and then the dog may become incontinent at five, six, seven, 10 years of age. Often the older dogs are not investigated in the same way as the young dogs because it's assumed that maybe it's due to old age and that's why the dog has become incontinent. But in breeds that are affected by ectopic ureter, it may well just be that this condition has been kind of lying dormant all this time and then has only become apparent when the muscle is weakened. So here's just the, the urine that might come out of an ectopic ureter. And what we'll find, if I can just draw, quite often ask people, well, if there's ectopic ureter, how come my dog can also urinate normally? So the answer is that if the urine comes out here into the urethra, it could go one of both ways. If this is nice and tight, this muscle, then the urine could still flow backwards into the bladder. And maybe when the dog is lying down asleep or resting and this muscle is weaker, we might find that some of the urine drips out this way. And in the male, even more so, the urine is mainly going to travel backwards into the bladder, even though it's coming out in the wrong spot. So these dogs will still urinate completely normally outside often, as well as having their urinary incontinence. We also find that not all ectopic ureter dogs are incontinent. So again, if that muscle is really nice and tight, then these dogs might be able to control their urination their whole life. We might not see anything at all, or they might present for other reasons, something like um, urinary tract infections that they are prone to. And that might indicate that there's something underlying. So if we're suspicious of this condition, we have um, a dog of a, a breed that we know is uh, affected by it. So in this case, the golden retriever, 
and we see either urinary incontinence at any age, or we have some other urinary tract issues such as infections, or something else that isn't right, like a, a very enlarged kidney that's found, then we would be suspicious of this disease. In order to diagnose it, we would initially recommend that each dog has a blood sample just to check that the kidney values are okay. And they are normally normal, if that makes sense. Um, we don't usually see any abnormalities, but it is worth checking just in case there is some significant kidney injury. And then we would always want to have a urine sample, which is, um, ha is looked at with a dipstick and maybe under the microscope and then is also sent away so it can be cultured for any bacteria that are in it so that we know before we start to do any other tests or treatment whether we're also dealing with infection. Infection is very common. If you have urine that's able to leak out, then that means that the bacteria are also able to go in. Now, how we get this urine sample varies a little bit. Our ideal sample is taken with a needle directly into the bladder, often with ultrasound guidance. And if we get our urine sample that way, then we know absolutely for certain that if we grow bacteria, they must have come from the bladder. If we catch a urine sample after it's been voided, so we just follow the dog around with the, a, a tray or some other bowl in order to catch the urine, then it will have touched the dog's hair and the bowl and other things on the way. And we won't necessarily know whether the bacteria are just contamination or whether they represent infection. If you have a puppy that's very incontinent, however, it may be that the bladder is never full enough to get the absolutely ideal test and we need to get whatever urine sample we can manage. Once we've done those initial tests, and if we've found an infection, we would treat it. Then we would look to ultrasound as a first test to see uh, what's going on. So in the picture, we've got Professor Mike Hurtage, who's a, a sort of legend of the University of Cambridge, who's uh, ultrasounding uh, one of the golden retrievers for me. So he will be looking at the kidney size and their structure to check if that's normal. And then he is able to follow the ureters as they come down from the kidneys towards the bladder. And he'll be able to look at what size they are and where exactly they're going. He'll also be able to look at bladder size and shape, make sure that that looks normal. And then we'll be looking for the entry points of the ureter into the bladder or urethra. And to help us do that, we quite often give a diuretic injection. And what that does is it just makes more jets of urine. So we've got a better chance to see them. It is very difficult, this ultrasound. It's easy to look at kidneys and it's easy to look at the bladder. But it's very challenging to look at ureters. So ultrasound to look at the ureters themselves is only going to be useful if you've got somebody very experienced doing that ultrasound and somebody ideally who looks for ectopic ureters um, many times. The main advantages of ultrasound are that they, it can be performed conscious. So the golden retrievers are an absolutely delightful breed to work with and uh, especially the, the show dogs, they are absolutely happy to be uh, laying down for the ultrasound and they will usually just just go off to sleep or take no notice whatsoever. Be nice and still and we can get some lovely images. If you have some other breeds of dog, then we may need to use sedation. Um, and so this is a non-invasive test and it gives us quite a lot of information about what's going on. If um, we're in a situation where there's nobody with the expertise to look at the ureters with ultrasound, then many of you will have come across um, this kind of a test, I'm sure, which is um, essentially an x-ray dye study or an x-ray contrast study. 
And we would call this, so the posh name for it is an intravenous urogram or IVU. So what we can see in this top image, this is just a, a plain X-ray of the abdomen of a dog. And we can see that there's nothing very distinct here. And certainly the ureters that are only two to three millimeters in diameter, we have no chance of seeing them on this image. So what we do is we inject a dye and that shows up on x-rays into a, a vein in the dog's leg. And once that dye goes around in the bloodstream, it will be filtered by the kidneys and then it will travel in the same way that urine will uh, and highlight those structures. So in this bottom image, this dog um, has been given the dye. We can see then we've got one kidney here. We've got one sitting just behind it. And now we can see these ureters. We've got one main one that we can see here. The other one is hiding a little bit at the back. But this one we can see nicely as it comes down towards the bladder. We've got a little bit of air in our bladder. This is kind of the outline of it here. So this is much more widely available, this test, because you just need an X-ray machine and the dye. But it does normally require um, a general anaesthetic. And there are very occasional allergic reactions to the contrast. The other thing that's problematic with this dye study is that the dye doesn't move smoothly along these ureters. The muscle is squeezing it along. And it's very difficult sometimes to see exactly where these ureters are going once they get into this bony pelvis area where everything is on top of each other and we can't quite see. So it's simple to do, but not so easy to interpret. We can also put the dye in the other way, so into uh, the penile urethra or in through the vulva. So hopefully this video will play. So the contract dye is going to be in black on this study. So we can see it's going up the urethra here. And actually it's just ducking into an ectopic ureter, which is coming into the prostate. I'll just see if I can get it off pen a second. Uh, okay, let's play this again. This is the dye coming in, and then it just nips off into this ectopic ureter. So again, this study is uh, widely available. We just need an x-ray machine and some dye, but it requires general anesthesia in females and sedation in males. CT is much more available now and, and many local veterinary practices now either have a CT scanner or have access to one. And with CT, what we get is a cross-sectional imaging. So we get slices through the body. And that means that we don't have this situation where lots of structures are on top of one another and we can't see. So this is the same um, injection dye study as we had on the X-ray in a different patient and it shows up the kidney really nicely. And we can start to see the ureter, which is nice and white. We can see the other kidney coming in on the other side. And then we'll start to see some dye in this huge ureter here. So CT is a, a good way if we don't have the expertise again for ultrasound, it gives you a really good idea of what's going on and it's very clear to interpret, um, but it is quite expensive. And so um, in our clinic, it's not something we use routinely. We tend to use it for very unusual cases only. So what I prefer in, in, in adjunct, uh, in combination, I guess, with the ultrasound is uh, what we call cystoscopy. And anything that ends in oscopy basically describes the use of a camera 
which is small and it can examine internal organs. So in this case, cystoscopy means we're examining the bladder and the urethra. And in a female, we can look at the vagina and the vestibule. So just start this video in a second. We're looking, we're in the urethra and we're going to be, this is our neck of our bladder. We're going to be coming into the bladder. So we're coming into the bladder. And this here is one of our, I'll just pause it. This is our right ureter opening. I think we just saw a minute ago some urine coming from that. So this is normal. This is inside the bladder. It's a normal shape and size. Then when we come back out of the bladder, we've got bladder neck, we can just see at the top of the image. And here, this opening, this opening is a ureter opening into the urethra. And so this is our ectopic ureter, which will be our left one, because we've seen that the right one is normal. So with cystoscopy, you actually get to see with your own eyes almost uh, exactly where the problem is and uh, what the anatomy is like. So that's my, my preference, a combination of ultrasound and cystoscopy. And we should know exactly what's going on then with these dogs. The other thing which we will come back to um, in terms of uh, maybe prevention of this condition is something called a persistent vestibulovaginal remnant, or we can shorten that to something called PVVR. And the reason this might be interesting to those of you involved in stud work is because this is a band of tissue. So it, it's the arrow here is pointing to it and another one here which is dividing the vaginal opening into two. Our urethra, which is where the urine comes out, is up here, marked with the blue spot. And this is the entrance to the vagina in the background here. So this band of tissue, this persistent vestibulovaginal remnant, we see in around 90 to 95% of dogs with ectopic ureters. You can have it in some dogs that don't have that condition, but that's much more unusual. And this one is very, very thin, wouldn't cause any problem, would break easily. This one's a bit thicker. This one here, we can see there's a tiny little opening to the vagina on this side. And then all of this section is abnormal tissue. And in this one, this is a, a dog with a, a terrible anatomy. So we've got the urethra where the urine would come out with the blue dot. We've got two ectopic ureters where my cursor is. And then we've got two little openings into the vagina and a big band of tissue in the way. So these two dogs on the bottom, it would be impossible for these dogs to mate and uh, to, to have any puppies. This one would be, it would be able to, and um, we'll come back to why we shouldn't, but it would be able to, this one I'm not sure. So this is something, some part of the anatomy that we might need to bear in mind. This doesn't need treating in itself, but it's just an interesting um, additional thing that we diagnose. So that's our, our diagnosis. What about treatment options? Well, the first thing to say is no matter how young we identify these puppies, if we want to treat the ectopic ureters, then we do need to wait until they're at least 12 weeks of age. Before that, their tissues are um, too prone to swelling and they're too small in order to uh, do the treatment practically and we need to wait for everything to just mature a little bit. So during this time, we obviously need to monitor their general well-being. these puppies. I have to say that all of the puppies that I've seen with this condition have otherwise been well-grown, so they've been the same size as the others. 
They don't tend to be the runt of the litter. They can definitely be the biggest. So they seem to stay very well, even if they um, do have some urinary tract infections. But we should make sure they're eating well, they're drinking well. And then we really need to take care of this vulval area because urine we know will scold the skin. And what we don't want is to get some nasty skin infections around those vulval folds. So this means that the puppies need to be washed regularly and then dried nicely. It's easier if we keep them on vet bed bedding as far as possible, because with the vet bed, any urine that is on the bed will get pulled through to the lower layer and the actual um, surface of the bed that the, the dog is lying on will stay dry. We don't want anything that's going to allow them, the urine to soak in and then for the dog to be lying on it and end up with that urine in contact with the skin. And then the, the um, cream or spray that I've had the most success with with various breeders looking after these puppies is uh, this spray here, which is called Cavalon spray, uh, which is widely available um, on the internet and from vets, it's not a prescription product. And this is a barrier spray that will then um, prevent direct contact of the urine with the skin and prevent any urine scold. Do need to make sure if we're using a barrier spray that the skin we're applying that to is really nice and clean and dry. Otherwise, if we have bacteria still on the skin or urine and we spray the barrier over the top, we're going to be trapping that in and that could make things worse. So the routine would need to be a bath of that area, thorough drying, then application of the spray. And that would be need to be done as frequently as needed depending on the level of incontinence. Then when they get to more than 12 weeks of age, then there are a number of treatment options. So for our intramural ectopic ureter, which was our most common condition, then we can do a minimally invasive treatment, which involves the camera and a laser. Sounds, sounds very cool, and uh, it, it is, I think. And uh, certainly very good for the puppies because as we'll see, the recovery is very quick. Open surgery is what we used to do and uh, will still be done in lots of places. And we could remove the affected kidney and ureter. That would be another uh, additional option. And we'd certainly do that if the kidney was very abnormal. If we have this rare type, this extramural type, then the only options are open surgery or removing that kidney or ureter. So this camera guided laser procedure can be done from as young as 12 weeks of age. And uh, the golden retrievers are normally a, quite a nice size by then, and the tissues are less prone to swelling. Oh, actually I'll just go back to this. So just to um, highlight with the pen, what we would be doing. Actually, I'm going to change my colour to red. Bear with me. So I'm not wanting to change colour now. I'll stick with green then. Ah, here we are, red. So our camera is going to come in up the urethra and then our laser is going to take away this inner wall. Up here, until our opening is now sighted here. So it's now in the bladder. And hopefully this will make sense on the next video. Get rid of my pen. There we are, okay. So this is going to be the same dog. So this is our normal right ureter that we saw before. 
We can see into the back of the bladder there. And this is our ectopic ureter opening. So now we're just coming back in. Here's our ectopic ureter opening again. And we're going to put this wire inside. I hope none of this is going to put anybody off their dinner. I haven't included anything that I thought was a, a gruesome picture. So I hope you're all okay with this. Then we put this orange catheter in. And then using that to, to, as a guide, we can then use this laser. And the laser just takes away that inner wall until this opening is moved back inside the bladder. Okay. So here's the laser still doing its work. Until we're eventually inside. And the reason that I really love this technique is because the post-operative care is absolutely minimal from an owner's perspective and from the puppy's perspective. So the recovery is really rapid. Nearly all of the dogs that I would treat would go home the same afternoon. They would just need to recover enough from their anesthetic and then they're ready to go. They don't need to have any exercise restriction and they can do absolutely all the normal puppy behaviors that we would expect. They can play with the other dogs. They can go back with their uh, mum if they want to. They can be just reintroduced straight into the house. They don't have to wear any um, buster collar because there's no incision or surgical site that we need to look at. And they're pretty happy about that. And uh, the worst, worst thing they could do is just, they might lick their vulva a little bit um, or their prepuce initially, but uh, that's just going to be uh, for a couple of days and they won't cause any harm. And we really see very, very few complications with this procedure. You would normally expect to see a little bit of blood in the urine for seven days. And other than that, um, that should be it. So no, no nasty surprises. In contrast, open surgery, we should only do from 16 weeks of age onwards, when the tissues have had even more chance to mature, because an open surgery is going to be a bigger deal. And uh, it's a more expensive option than the laser. We also find that for the post-operative care, couldn't find a golden retriever puppy with a, a buster collar on, so uh, this is a little uh, rescue uh, dog called Moomin. Um, so they would normally, after an open surgery, need to stay in the hospital two to three nights. We obviously do have a surgical incision then, so they normally have to have a buster collar on to prevent them licking. And it can be difficult in a multi-dog household to prevent the other dogs from licking. So might even need a medical pet t-shirt or something. We'd need to restrict exercise or, or, and play for two weeks. And so that obviously, uh, to some extent, limits their socialization for a period where they're being treated. So when it's necessary, then we can do this. But if there's another option to do the laser treatment, then that is preferred. Medical treatment on its own isn't normally effective until we correct the anatomy. Um, but some of you may have seen this, which is called propylene syrup, which is a very common um, treatment for incontinence in dogs. And what about doing no treatment? Well, we, we know that there are dogs that have ectopic ureters that are totally fine. So we might have some dogs that there's no problem. But in dogs that have incontinence or have urinary tract infections, if we do nothing, there's a potential that we might get a very serious 
uh, kidney issues. So I've outlined in green here, um, this is a, a dye study where we've got one kidney, which is a normal size. And then the side with the ectopic ureter, we've now got this gigantic kidney, which is like a sack full of urine because of the back pressure that's built up here. So this um, does need to be treated or it could be cause a, a very severe problem. And we might have cases where we just get lots of, of urinary tract infections and that's quite miserable for the dog. In terms of prognosis, then unfortunately, correcting this plumbing doesn't result in um, resolution of the problem in all cases. And that's probably the most frustrating thing about this condition. So in males, it's very effective, the treatment, because they've got this lovely long urethra. So if we correct their ectopic ureter, we would have a 95% plus success rate in having a nice continent normal dog afterwards. With the females, this urethra is much shorter and it seems as though many of these dogs also have a weak muscle controlling this tube. And so in females, we find that it's only about 65, 65 to 70% maybe um, successful in um, causing complete continence after we've corrected the anatomy. And in the remaining dogs, we think that this tube, the urethra, the muscle around it is too weak. And that still allows urine leakage uh, tending to be when the, the dogs are, are sleeping or lying down. So that's a big frustration. Ideally, we would hope that if we were corrected the plumbing, then everything would be okay. Most arse, however, significantly improved, even if they're not completely dry. And we may be able to um, completely solve the problem as we'll see with maybe some other options. So which dogs do well and which don't? Well, this is uh, one subject of our research at the moment because this is kind of the holy grail of treatment. If we could identify in advance which puppies were going to become dry and go on to have no further problems and which were not, then obviously we'd know which, which puppies to treat and which to advise not to. But this is uh, an area where we know what doesn't make a difference, but we haven't yet found the, the sort of uh, the early sign, which is this dog is going to, to do well or it isn't. So different researchers have looked at lots of different things to see if it makes any difference to the outcome. And what they found are lots and lots of things that do not make any difference. So it doesn't make a difference if it's just one ectopic ureter and one normal, or both are ectopic. It doesn't matter if the ectopic ureter is just missing the bladder or if it's all the way out into uh, the vagina or vestibule. It doesn't matter what type of treatment they have. So open surgery or laser have the same outcome. Doesn't matter if they've had infections before, and, and many other things. So we know what doesn't make a difference, but we haven't yet found what does. Now, part of the problem with previous research studies is that they have had many, many different breeds and many different ages of dog. And so that has brought in a variability, which means it's difficult to then sort the wood for the trees. So at Cambridge, what we've been looking at, um, thanks to uh, the Golden Retriever Society and seeing lots of one breed with this problem, we have been looking at just Golden Retrievers. And so far we're up to about 30 cases that we've treated over the last couple of years. And we're hoping that because we are looking then at one breed, and almost all of them have been 12 to 14 weeks of age, that maybe with that group that's much more controlled, we will be able to find the answer to this question. Can we predict the, the puppies that will do well?
So I think the jury's still out on that at the moment, but we're still collecting data. And uh, I, I hope we'll have something further to report in due course. What about if we don't treat, achieve a dry puppy after we've replumbed the anatomy? We would uh, make sure that we've treated any urinary tract infection. And then usually we would add this propylene to the treatment, which tightens up that muscle of the urethra and hopefully stops the leaks. And we would then wait until a first season has passed which unfortunately with the golden retrievers can be quite a long wait. If you've got a small breed dog, obviously you only have to wait until they're around six or seven months. But with the, the goldens, then we're usually looking at 12 to 14 months for a first season um, in order to find out if that's going to make any difference. And what we hope is that when they have that surge of estrogen, that that's going to tighten up that muscle and um, make the difference between uh, the last little bit of incontinence and being dry. After that, there are further options, um, but it all gets more technically difficult to achieve dryness if we haven't had a season and we've tried medical treatment and that still doesn't work. And then we're looking at more like surgical treatments, such as this implant in the bottom right. The next question I always get asked is what about neutering? So what we know is, that in medium to large breed dogs, that if we um, spay them, particularly talking about females here, that it can lead to a weaker urethra and it can lead to what we call spay incontinence. And so there are some risks with spaying a dog that's already prone to incontinence as to whether that lack of estrogen will um, cause the incontinence to return. And I think what we've discovered so far is that if we um, have a successful treatment of ectopic ureters, the anatomy is all corrected and the dog is completely dry, then it's likely that it's fine to spay that dog if needed, um, ideally after one to two seasons to allow the um, genital system to completely mature. If there's any incontinence remaining after treatment, then we feel that it's better to leave the dogs entire as long as possible. But obviously we would advocate neutering if there was any medical reason, um, like a pyometra, for example, which is an infection of the uterus. So can we prevent this condition? This is the question. So this is where a lot of our research has been headed. And uh, a lot of what we've been doing is based on some previous work for this breed, which uh, is quite a rare breed, so you may or may not have seen these around. Uh, these are the Entlebuka mountain dogs. These are a small Swiss mountain breed, and I think in the UK there's only approximately 50 of these dogs registered. So very, very small niche breed, and these dogs uh, have a huge problem with ectopic ureters. So based on that, and because they're very small in numbers, uh, they have introduced a, a, an ultrasound screening test for um, both the dams and the sires. And that has to be performed before you can breed one of these dogs That's on their list of required tests. There's also been quite a lot of work into um, the DNA of these dogs uh, searching for uh, the elusive DNA test, which might, uh, might be able to be the answer to our, our problems and we could screen our, our dogs for this before breeding. Uh, the DNA tests are still ongoing and, uh, and, and that gene or genes uh, are elusive at the moment because it's quite a complex um, inherited disease. But what they have been doing with the ultrasound screening is that they have been looking at the position of the ureters and their openings. So we ultrasound the dogs and then the dogs are assigned a score of A, B or C for each ureter. So an A is a score that they get if the distance from the ureter opening to the bladder neck is greater than or equal to two centimeters. 
If it's within the bladder, but less than two centimeters, they would score a B. And if the ureter is ectopic, so opening into the urethra, they would score a C. And the overall score relates to the worst ureter. So if a dog had a, a right one that was an A and a left one that was a B, overall it would be a B. So we replicated this in the Golden Retrievers to see if this was the case in, um, in that breed as well. Are there dogs that have A, B and C type and are otherwise clinically completely normal? So they don't have any history of any urinary problems. Here's just some ultrasound images. So this is a type A, this red, um, Jet here is one of the ureters. It's measuring 2.7 centimeters, that's lovely. The B one, we can lose a little bit the measurement, but that's kind of 1.2 centimeters. And then in our C type, we've got our parallel lines indicating we're in the urethra. We've got our two tiny little red jets. So we asked for volunteers to come down to Cambridge and um, we had 50 dogs that agreed to come and take part. 16 of them were male and 34 of them were female. And we scored their um, ureters as A, B or C. And we've got quite a lot of A's as we can see, relatively fewer B's and then only a few C's, but obviously these are the most important. So we found that about 10% just over of the male and female normal adult dogs had ectopic ureters. And obviously these owners um, didn't know that because the dogs were completely normal. So this was a really interesting finding and ties into what they found in the Entlebuchers. So in the Entlebucher scheme, then um, what they would do is they would screen um, all of the dogs and then they would exclude any with C-type ureters, so those that have an ectopic ureter from breeding, and they would allow A's and B's to breed. They, unfortunately, their, their, their dogs are not, are not great and they don't have very many A's, if any, so they're really breeding with these B-type. Now, when you do this, this is a, an ultrasound screening test for, for the particular dog you're looking at. It doesn't tell you anything about the DNA of that dog. So you can have dogs that are normal, they've got A or B type ureters, and they're still carriers of the abnormal gene. And uh, hopefully that's something you've come across before with other diseases. So the mother or the father don't have the problem, but somewhere in their DNA, they are carriers of the problem. So with the Entlebuchers, when they use this scheme and they exclude these C-type dogs from breeding, they will reduce their incidence of ectopic ureters in the breed. And they have done by about 40% over five years, but they will not, um, not get rid of it entirely because you will still have it hiding in the DNA of the normal dogs. Now with the Golden Retrievers, it's such a big breed that it would be impossible to um, test all of the dogs before breeding, even if you wanted to, because the ultrasound is a very specialist thing to do. So instead we could look at um, which dogs might be most useful to test. So in just thinking about this, um, if the dam or the sire has any history of themselves of having urinary tract issues, so that might be multiple infections or um, any other abnormal urinary signs, or they've previously um, either given birth to or sired affected puppies, then those dogs would be interesting to assess them to see if they themselves are affected. Of course, they might not be. Back to this abnormal band that we usually see in combination with ectopic ureters, 
anyone that's working um, with stud dogs and might be doing vaginal examinations as part of that work. This is just really um, to flag up that if you um, felt anything quite um, abnormal or you felt this band of tissue dividing um, the vagina, then that, uh, that would be a flag to me that maybe there's a problem. And certainly if there was any sort of anatomical difficulty with mating, then maybe this is the reason. There's something happening here in combination with the ectopic ureters that's preventing that dog from being able to be mated. And it'll be useful to check. And then maybe um, we could look at the stud dogs, um, not those that are only uh, siring a few litters, but we know that there are some dogs that are going to go on to sire many, many litters. And maybe those uh, would be good dogs to check. Again, it's not going to be foolproof. They could be perfect themselves, but still carry that DNA somewhere in their genome. And ultimately with the, the assessment of the, the dogs that we know are normal because they've had ultrasound screening and DNA that we're collecting from all of our clinical cases, we're still uh, hoping that again, another holy grail, one day we might find a, a DNA test for this condition, which would then allow um, all potential breeding dogs to be tested before having a litters. So uh, I hope you followed that and it wasn't too technical for you. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. That was super. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I, I've got a, um, a question about, uh, it was very interesting to hear that in some breeds, it's not, EU is not seen at all. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I find that, quite uh, interesting you said into species specific condition we see it in human beings as well mm -hmm. um so uh, have you any thoughts sort of thoughts about why is it just not being reported in some breeds or no know? i think it genuinely doesn't occur in in some breeds you can um there are some breeds which have quite a lot of incontinence for other reasons for example they get a lot of spay incontinence yeah and so they have been investigated thoroughly but it's never ever been sort of found in any of those mm -hmm. dogs so it does really seem to be just some breeds that are affected and others it's not in their not in their dna and they don't have it in that breed okay oh that's very that it is very interesting um do you see other abnormalities, things like um, bifurcated ure ureters and things with it? And no, we don't actually. I know that's a big issue in children. Yeah. Um, they can have all sorts of different anatomical variations, but um, dogs seem to be very sort of simple from that point of view in that they, they all have just the same abnormality, the ureter, which is usually that intramural type and then just that band across the vagina, which yeah. you kind of have to wonder if that's nature's way of solving the problem. Yeah, the block in part, it. because yeah. in, in many of the most severely affected dogs, then that is actually preventing physically mating of that, that dog for a female. Um, so obviously it does nothing uh, prevents the males from mating, mm. but for the females, that's kind of nature's little safety uh, protection. Yeah, and um, do you only see the, the the strictures or the bands with EU, or can you get can you get them where the dog has normal urological? So they, have, they have been reported in dogs that haven't got um, ectopic ureters, but quite rarely. So if you found the band, it wouldn't necessarily mean that the dog had ectopic ureters but it would be worth checking if you see what I mean. It's certainly likely that they may have. Yeah. It. So just talking to some stud owners who might be doing, for example, vaginal exams, they did tell me that sometimes they have felt something that's been unusual that could have been that. Yes. And I, it's important that we're not breaking that band in order to allow mating if that could be a sign of a bigger problem. Yes. 
Certainly, certainly. And I think some in the past people have done that. Yes, yeah, I think so. You know, to, to, to then allow a mating. But it also may be a, a, something to look at where people can't get their bitch tied. Yes. So, yeah. Absolutely. And the other thing I was wondering about is when you, if you do own a stud dog and you're taking semen for exportation, do you see more liquid in the semen sample? Do you see urine in yeah. the semen you sample? Do. And if, if certainly if you had a stud dog where the, the sperm wasn't very active or there seemed to be, you know, a potential stud dog, I guess, where there was maybe an issue, contamination with low levels of urine might be the reason why that dog isn't isn't producing uh, successful matings like you would expect. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, in humans, we use a, a Teflon injection to the external urethra to help with incontinence. Have you tried that with your cohort? Yeah, so we um, have uh, injections of collagen that we can use in a very similar way. Um, it tends to not be a good treatment for um, dogs with that have failed ectopic ureter treatment, mainly because of their age. And um, I think similar to in, in people, it's, it's more recommended for older dogs because the effect of it wears off mm. after a while. So it, it's a good minimally invasive treatment and it can work really well, but after maybe a year, the effect often reduces and you need to repeat the treatment. Yeah. So if you have a 10 year old dog, that's an ideal, treatment because it doesn't require an operation um, but if you have a, a one-year-old dog that could be yeah, a, a repeated procedure, procedure. Yeah. Okay. yeah that's very interesting right I can see that we've got uh, lots of people asking question so um thank you for the very the great and very enlightening seminar I'd like to ask does um prostatitis the prostate in male have any effect on masking the EU? No, I don't think so. I think that's a separate issue with male dogs. Just as they age, they get an enlarged prostate and then that can lead to um, urinary tract signs or some pain around that area. But that's common to all entire male dogs and wouldn't be likely to be connected. Yeah, and it's more the length of their urethra, isn't it, that masks the symptoms in the male, the fact that you've got a much more muscular tube that's able to contain the leakage and create retrograde urine flow. Yes, absolutely. Much more successfully, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, Pamela Carr to everybody, I have t two EU dogs would you like their DNA? I live in Bermuda. Oh, well, uh, yes, absolutely. We're always interested in um, sort of adding to our DNA store, which might help. Um, so I, I'm happy to um, give my email address to you. Penny, if anyone wants to contact me, we can post DNA swab swap with um, instructions. And um, although you've probably all done them lots before for eye tests and things, have you? Well, we, we have done, but um, obviously it, it's it's where to send those swaps and, you know, the, 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 the significance of the data that you may want to collect around the swabs. Yes. Um, so if they've got veterinary reports or, or imagery that they may be able to share with you, that might be useful as well. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. just in case that anyone has contributed DNA, before um, and is wondering about that. The the previous samples were, um, a lot of them were stored at the Animal Health Trust, but um, just to reassure anybody, all of those samples have been transferred to the University of Cambridge with those researchers oh, now. So they're all safe and, and well, and they've just been moved, moved over. So nothing has been lost. That's brilliant, because I know most of us have been quite worried about what's going to happen in the future and the fact that we contributed samples from dogs that we no longer own um, so it's really good to hear that yeah yeah is there any connection observed between eu and renal dysplasia or other um, connected problems with development or uses of renal st structures it, yeah so 
we we do see some puppies that have abnormal definition of their kidneys as well as ectopic ureter. The thing that's difficult to determine is the two things that would look very similar are renal dysplasia, which is a, a an abnormality that that puppy is born with, where the kidneys just haven't quite formed right, versus an ectopic ureter puppy would be much more likely to have an infection that's tracked up to the kidneys. And if they have had infection grumbling along in the kidneys for a few weeks, that could look very similar on the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. um, in people, there's, they do a lot more um, kidney biopsies, but it's not something that we do very often in dogs. So often we then just need to make sure we've treated the infection and then wait and see as far as the, the kidneys are concerned, whether they might deteriorate or, or whether they're likely to stay the same. Okay, so what, what would you do a series of views and E's or would you do it imagery as well? Yeah, I think in the first instance to, to keep an eye on, on urinalysis and whether they can concentrate their urine adequately, keep an eye on water intake. Yeah. And if either of those two things changed, okay. then we would look at the kidneys again. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you for a very interesting topic and explanation of um, renal dysplasia related to EU and how. I think you've just answered that, isn't it? Yeah. But it isn't, yeah. If there's any evidence of hereditary mechanism, recessive or dominant. So the only thing I think that's known so far is that, it, as I said, it's complex. So it seems to involve multiple genes rather than just one. And, and that's why it's so difficult to pin down where the problem might be. Yeah, it may, it may arise, yeah. Yeah. Um, so another one about, are there any thoughts to the possible mode of inheritance? Just that it's multi poly polygenetic and. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are you doing any, um, any analysis of pedigrees as you're doing your study? Yeah. So the, I've got a, a student that's been working on that at the moment. So we've been constructing a, a pedigree tree based on the clinical cases and also the normal dogs that we screened that we know whether they're definitely normal or ectopic and we've added in all of those dogs she's just finishing um this july so she'll be analyzing her results so she's gone back six generations at the moment we may need to go back 10 generations to really follow any lines back but uh, it's obviously a, a lot of work constructing those pedigree yeah. trees so I can uh, imagine it gets very complicated doesn't it, it the does. further back you go yeah. yeah exactly but we'll, we'll see what she finds first of all and then see if we need to widen that or go back further um I I was sort of wondering if you do get a wet puppy in the litter mm -hmm. it, what, what would you kind of think? Do you, do you see sort of like 20% of the litter being affected or, you know, is there a kind of a prevalence within a, a, an affected litter or can you just have a single puppy that's, that's affected? So usually there's one puppy that's clinically affected. What we don't yet know is, are there any other puppies in the litter? I guess, particularly the males that maybe are affected, but are not incontinent mm -hmm. and one of the things that I would like to do at some stage but it's just difficult with the dogs moving all to new homes is it would be great to be able to ultrasound scan an entire litter where one is known to be affected but that obviously depends on all of the owners the new owners agreeing to bring the puppies because what, they're what age would you want to see them ideally I would think around 12 months, which is what we did for the, yeah. the previous study, because then there's no effect likely with growth or any, anything else. Um, so I, I have had a couple of um, breeders who, you know, have maybe their dogs all go relatively local and they keep in touch with all the yeah. owners. So I've probably got some starting points when we can um, do that and see if that's possible, but it would be interesting. Yeah, I guess if it is um, very polygenic, polygenetic that you are 
sometimes just going to get the one puppy and there's a possibility that the rest may be clear but um depending on how that russian roulette forms you may well get you know you may well be seeing others mightn't you it would be suspicious yeah. anyway and worth investigating i think it's yeah. the most that I've heard of in the last couple of years was a litter of seven where three were affected. Yeah, okay. And did had the other were the others then screened out of the litter or not? No, they no. weren't, no. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So there's um one from somebody who is new to breeding and they have their first wet puppy awaiting surgery. The dam sister is expecting her first litter too, and we use the same stud dog before we suspected wet puppy. Should we expect another wet puppy? So not necessarily, no. I think it's so complex, the heritability, that in fact you could, you could repeat this. If you repeated the exact same mating several times, I think you still might only end up with the one ectopic puppy and all the rest are, are fine so I think there's a there's a slight increased risk because those dogs are related and one of them must be carrying the, the, G, some the, of the genes, genes. Yeah. but equally as, as Penny said it's a bit Russian roulette and actually it's it's perfectly possible that all of the puppies would be would be normal mm, it's interesting it's a wet one you wouldn't be surprised but um but I hope for, I hope for you that they're all all okay. Yeah. Are there any other, I mean, in humans, we're quite aware that some diseases do occur as a, as a result of the genetics, but you can also have other situations that may cause the same disease, you know, so like yeah. things like breast cancer could be traumatic, could, could be genetic, mm -hmm. it might just be bad luck, you know, there's lots of other things sort of going on there. Do you think there are any other factors that may be responsible for EU, any terogenetic things or? Well, we just don't know is the answer, I guess. I guess if I, I'd probably expect a slightly more random uh, anatomical problem if it was uh, something else. Um, like maybe one kidney is also much smaller than the other and, and a whole side has developed abnormally yeah. or in dogs, when you have true congenital urinary tract abnormalities, often the genital system, so either the ovary and uterus or the testicle on that side is also abnormal. Mm. Um, so that's what I've seen with other, other different congenital abnormalities, but I've never seen anything like that with an ectopic ureter. No, no, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I guess until we've got the DNA tests and it's been well tested, as a, as a test that we won't really necessarily know the answer to that, will we? It'll, no. you know. Um, hi, Laura and her team operated on my dog, Billy, last year, and it was a great success. He was five years old when diagnosed and he stopped leaking immediately after the operation. And she would highly recommend Laura and her team. Thank you very much, Linda. I hope Billy is well. And uh, uh, he was a lovely patient. Yeah, that's great. Um, from Victoria, I have um, Lola, who was um, expertly treated by Laura for EU, and is also Ellie, who Laura removed her kidney. Lo Lola is dry most of the time now with the um, artificial urethral sphincter cuff and propylin. How likely is it that she will remain dry as she ages, please? And thank you for everything you have done for us. Oh, hi Vicky, it's been a while since I've spoken to you, so it's nice to see you here tonight. Um, I think we still don't know a lot about um, the ageing process in this condition because we've only really started looking into it in more detail in the past five years and for me I guess the last three, year, three or four years, so we haven't really seen these dogs uh, out to older age now but I'd be really interested if there's anyone um, as well as Vicky that has had dogs treated to um, for you to keep in touch and we'll only answer these questions by really following these dogs out um, to 10 12 years of age to see what happens I would suspect that everything will would stay roughly the same until maybe the age of um, eight to 10 onwards 
in which case we might then see some aging weakness and, uh, and Lola might need either um, some addition of some fluid to her cuff um, or a change in the propylene dose. I can't remember off the top of my hand if she is uh, still entire or not, um, but uh, there's an option of adding estrogen uh, if, if she is um, neutered. Sorry, I can't remember that. Uh, quite a lot of golden retrievers. I remember Lola well, but it's not whether she's neutered. Oh, that's great, thank you. So from Mikhail, I bred a litter with six puppies. Out of the five bitches, three were wet. I had uh, one bilateral EU, one unilateral, and one with normal ureters, but a shortened urethra. The first bitch was operated on as she had a necrotic kidney. The one bitch um, has been left, is four and leaking, but otherwise healthy. Another has a shortened urethra. Is there something to be done for the one with the shortened urethra? And is it still worth operating the second bitch? I'm in South Africa and this was my first litter with a problem. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. That's a very stressful situation with three out of the six having a problem. And um, it, it just sadly shows sometimes the unfortunate roll of the dice that you can be thrown when you're breeding. And um, uh, so based on your the dogs that you're talking about, the one with the, the shortened urethra, the, there are surgical options and medical options for that. So the simplest thing to try would be um, the propylene that I mentioned before, which is a syrup that goes on their food. And that helps that muscle to tighten up and might be enough to solve the problem. It might be that actually there's a surgical option needed and the main options would be the artificial sphincter cuff, which may or may not be available in South Africa, I'm not sure, um, or a, a procedure called colpo suspension or something like collagen injections, which is, probably is too young still to have that. So there are options for the shortened urethra um, none of them come with any guarantees unfortunately that's what we learn doing urinary work that the whole system is so complicated that when we try to apply a relatively simple solution to it it doesn't overcome all of the issues so most of the time we'd expect to see a significant improvement but to get some of these dogs absolutely dry can be a real challenge the other the other bitch um who's now four um it, it's, I think, certainly worth be worth having a look at her again to make sure that there's no problems with her kidneys developing. Um, if she is absolutely fine, not getting urinary tract infections and her kidneys were examined and they were normal and you're okay with the incontinence and she is, then I guess that you don't have to do anything. But if you did want to treat her, then the outcome is likely to be just as successful as when she was a puppy. That's great. So from Lindsay, would you expect to see other issues in a very young puppy, such as general organ failure or failure to thrive with an EU puppy? I think you said in your talk, they're often really bonny, healthy puppies other than this. Yeah, so certainly all the ones I've seen have been absolutely in great health otherwise. Um, whereas lots of congenital conditions, we would expect that those dogs to be the runt of the litter and uh, your heart usually sinks when uh, it's usually uh, somebody who has never owned a dog before and they've been somewhere slightly less scrupulous and seen the runt in the corner, felt mm. sorry for it and taken it home and then they find there's something terrible wrong with it. Um, so I haven't seen that at all with the EU puppies. They've all been delightfully healthy. The ones I don't see are the ones that, that never make it as far as any treatment because um, for whatever reason um, the breeder decides not to not to go ahead with that and has the puppies euthanized so I don't know in any of those cases whether they have been unwell uh, or not. No. Um, do, do dogs who have the laser surgery need to be revaluated um, the instance of more incontinent that may result? So I think that means if they start to become incontinent after the procedure. Yeah, 
So I think in an in an ideal world, then if if you had a, a dog that became dry after the procedure and then there was a problem later down the line, then ideally you would reinvestigate to to check that everything was okay and and all the plumbing and everything was as you'd left it. All of the dogs I have reinvestigated, the ureters have healed up absolutely fine after the laser and I've never found a, a problem that can be corrected in terms of the anatomy again. It's usually that that urethra, the tube going from the bladder to the outside, the muscle there has become weak and, uh, and that's why they're incontinent again rather than the original problem. Mm, that's great. Um, I think I think that's uh, Pamela again. Sorry, that, that may be the result of ureters repositioning out of the bladder again. But once you've corrected them, that correct that correction stays, doesn't yes, it? It's, they don't move. Yes. And it, you don't you don't get sort of regrowth or anything like that. No. Not that I've ever seen. No. It's really good with the laser surgery that you don't need to put a J stent in or anything to keep the orifice open afterwards. Yes, and I've yes. certainly seen that done, um, you know, in humans and, um, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's fantastic, isn't it? Because of the, the less traumatic mode of laser surgery, um, it's probably yeah. why we're getting such good results from it. Well, I think it's just so much nicer to treat the puppies with a minimally invasive procedure because, you know, anything else, they look so sad afterwards for a bit and and with this it's really just the anesthetic that they notice yeah and that's worn off they don't seem to know that anything has been done yeah done. and they don't seem to be uncomfortable urinating which you would imagine that they would be but yeah. um they don't ever seem to show anything yeah it is it is amazing isn't it you know and they're very 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 forgiving at that age i find you know so yeah. Even if you've made them drunk and sleepy, they'll still love you, you know. Yeah. It's not, uh... yeah, it doesn't put them off coming to the vets or get in the way of their socialization or just stop them being the, the nice all round puppy that you want them to be. There's no point in having a dog that's been treated for something but is not a good pet because they're yeah. fearful of vets and fearful of people and, yeah. and all manner of other things. Which with a longer, more complex procedure, that there may be some elements of that won't you know yeah. have to stay in. So um, I'm happy to reach uh, to reach you to my new owners to see if um, I think if they would participate. Um, yeah. Thank you. yeah, so that's great. Uh, if you want to drop me an email, I can sort of correlate things and send them on to you, Laura. That yeah, would be that's great. lovely. Yeah. Uh, from Pamela, I had 25% of my litter with EU, eight puppies and two with EU. Yeah, again, yeah. Un unlucky, unfortunately, that that's, that was the case. And uh, that, I mean, I think it, it's a, a, a good thing to be aware of if you're, if you're thinking of breeding a golden retriever and it's not something that you know about. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's just good to be aware of all the things the pitfalls I guess that yeah. that aren't just uh, always going to result in healthy mum healthy puppies and breeding unfortunately that has some bad times as well as plenty of good times very much Laura I mean it, it is it is complex and you know you can be faced with all sorts of things with puppies that you have to make decisions about um, you know I've been breeding for 40 years and you have the odd thing that props up and, and as a breeder I, I feel you have to make that decision very quickly about what you're going to do mm -hmm. if it's not a viable puppy I think it's right to to euthanize them I think if they can live a good quality of life with the condition whatever whether it's a urological thing or you know um, you know I think then it's worth investing in in um, trying to get them into a good place so they can have a nice quality of life but it's your responsibility as a breeder I believe and I think as much as possible you shouldn't pass your problems on to other people I like to try and deal with things whilst they're in my hands and yeah. uh, not not um, not not be selling puppies to people and then them having problems later on so yeah um, so to send DNA, will my vet know exactly how to collect it? Are you, you're doing 
buckle swabs, cheek swabs. Yeah. yeah. You know, you'll be able to do that yourself. It doesn't need a vet to, to do that. It's just a case of rubbing the swab on the inside of the cheek and then letting it air dry and then uh, sending it back. So it, it shouldn't be complicated, but we can sort some instructions. The swabs do usually come with a little sheet, you know, because your yeah. dog's not supposed to have been eating within so many hours. And Yeah, and, I think um, when our, our soft tissue nurse has just had an operation on her foot, so she's just off work at the minute, but when she's back, and the other thing I could get her to do is just to make a little video. Oh, fantastic. Of her doing it. Yeah. And then, uh, again, you could maybe put that on your, your YouTube channel page and uh, and then anyone who wants to refer back to that yeah have a look at how to do it that would be really helpful thanks very much for that laura otherwise your vet or a vet nurse will be able to do it no problem it just involves uh, obviously taking the dog down there which still with covid times is a bit tricky isn't it yeah i think one of the things is when we do dna tests for specific diseases there is a space for the veterinary signature but that is the, the fact that your vet has checked the chip yes. and has, is authenticating that it's that dog, not that it's a difficult procedure to do. It's, um, it, it's that that I think they get confused about a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have a girl that's four years old who was born with um, extramural EU that did have the output into the vagina, not the ure urethra. She had an open surgery done and is still incontinent, especially before her season, as she's kept complete. Is the progesterone causing this increase in leaking um, presentation? I would gladly participate in the study for the DNA and pedigree data. Thank you very much for your work. Uh, thank you, Radka. Um, so I think the, the hormones, the two options are either the hormones are causing the, the problem, which I think in that case is most likely. The other thing I wonder sometimes is um, as the cervix is opening for the season, whether then, but you've got different bacterial flora around in the vagina and maybe you're, there is an increased risk at that point in time of getting an ascending infection which maybe isn't severe enough to show any signs, but might just be enough to make them more incontinent temporarily. Mm. Um, would be interesting to kind of do some urine dipsticks around that time to see if there's any change. But um, I've definitely had other owners who have said that things have dramatically changed around the time of the season, but it's not always the same. Some people seem to report that when they come into season and I think everything is more swollen, that they're much drier. And then other people have reported that their, their incontinence is worse. So I think that's something we really don't quite understand what's going on. Yeah. An infection can definitely be a transient self-limiting thing, can't it? You know, so the dog can get a bit of cystitis. And if it's drinking well and voiding, and it'll clear that infection, won't won't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So they have to be a problem. Um, so, but as a breeder, it's also important to let people know you have bred an EU pup. Too many push this issue under the rug and move on. I, I'm afraid um, that there's an awful lot of of you know people that restrict knowledge and don't share I would say in situations where people do do share knowledge in situations and we're supportive of each other that enables people to make better choices I know um, I had an issue with a posterior polar cataract and I was trying to breed away from it and I would ask breeders about what incidents they'd had and very, very few people would be honest. Mm. And I used a dog who the breeder said, oh, I've never had it. And had my first case of actual juvenile posterior polar cataract. And I think if we shared and supported each other, our, our, our role as breeders would be much, much easy because there are other things as well as the EU that we need to be you know, careful about. Um, and we know our own pedigrees and the dogs within those, but 
it, it makes such a big difference if we can share that knowledge. So it's different, difficult, isn't it? Um, so thanks so much for Laura and Midland for such an interesting and informative afternoon. You're welcome, Lindsay. From Amy, thank you so much, Laura and Midland, for an insightful tea time chat, really fascinating. And from Radke, um, we'll do the recommendation checks. Thank you for the suggestion. We will do anything to manage the situation to make it better and help her to be more comfortable. Absolutely, absolutely. Because it does present challenges dealing with chronic incontinence in dogs, doesn't it? You know, they yeah. can very easily become smelly and, um, you know, that washing them every day or a couple of times a day, it can be quite a, a, a task on top of everything else in life. Yeah, I think I've uh, sort of over the years, I've seen many, many different owner and dog combinations yeah. and it astonishes me sometimes what some owners can deal with and are happy to deal with and when another another person just wouldn't be able to even yeah. contemplate that and uh, and it depends a lot on how you know how I guess how much time you have how your house is set up as to whether it's something that's easy to manage how many dogs you have there are, are, are lots and lots of different factors whether people have children who might go around putting their hands in things that they shouldn't. Um, there are lots of factors, but I totally can understand uh, how difficult it can be to, to live with a dog with incontinence. Yeah. So Alfred Pamela, thank you, Dr. Laura. My dogs are uh, treated by Dr. Bennett in New York at AMC. Uh, yeah. Dr. Dr. Brent is, uh, Alison is, um, is, is the queen of, uh, of this condition and, uh, her and her husband, uh, Chick Vice, they were the ones that developed the laser okay. technique. So you absolutely couldn't be in better hands there. Yeah. And uh, I had the pleasure to be trained by Dr. Brent uh, twice in New York. So it's a great place to visit as well. If, uh, if you have to go for some training uh, for work, then New York isn't the worst place to go, that's for sure. Yeah, I was very lucky. I got to go on a scholarship. Wow. So, yeah yeah so I spent uh, five days there which was wonderful yeah so it's, it's amazing isn't it um I have to be thankful for a couple of UK retriever Facebook pages that directed me towards Laura experienced owners have been very helpful and gave me the support I need wow that's good that's great I, I love to have a story where social media has had a good effect rather than a negative one. So uh, that, that's a, a, a great thing to, uh, to hear. Yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. So I think, Laura, we've come to the end of our questions and I can only say thank you so much for giving us your time, your knowledge and your expertise. And um, I'm sure that sharing this knowledge is absolutely crucial to, um, you know, to, to finding better ways of breeding and, and for the health of our dogs which we all adore and, and love and um, I know everybody when things like this do happen it it's causes many people you know a lot of anxiety and worry and stress and things but it's lovely to know that things can be done and that um, you know maybe it should make some breeders think that euthanasia you know of a little puppy might not be necessary um, because obviously there are some successful stories out there and um, dogs are, are living you know some very good qualities of life which is is fantastic to know yeah so, yeah so thank you so much and thank you for uh, thank you for everything and um, I'm sure that you'll uh, be seeing a lot more of the golden retriever people um, from all over the place uh, as a result of your seminar. They're very, very popular in the yeah. clinic, that's for sure. So uh, everybody loves a golden retriever puppy. That is uh, yeah. definitely the case. And uh, they have maximum number of cuddles uh, <laughs> from, uh, from everybody. Yeah, yeah, oh, I can just imagine. They are just such a bundle of fun and it's that wonderful personality, I believe, that 
that makes it such a, an enduring and, and lovely breed you know it's yeah. so, so wonderful I'm always but, joking that they shouldn't be charged any kennel fees because they're never in the kennel when I go around and uh, are they all with the vet nurses <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh that, that's super yeah that's lovely and it's reassuring because when you do send your dog into hospital and things you always worry how stressed they're going to be and on their own and things but clearly clearly um they're not no no yeah, yeah. oh that's lovely so thank you once again on behalf of the midland golden retriever club and for everybody that signed up today and also to anna and her husband for doing all the admin behind, which is uh, no small task with um, 100 people signing up for the seminar today. Um, it's been a really wonderful experience and I hope you've all enjoyed it. And, um, you know, as I say, you can email um, Midland Golden with any questions or anything that you would like to contribute and we can hand those on to Laura so we can make a decision what to do. And I do know Margaret Woods is continuing, I think, to collect samples and, and direct people as well um, to your clinic. So I'm sure that that will continue on. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, you're most welcome. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Ricardo. Bye.